Hey, Allison. Hey. Are you ready to review Afterlife? What? <laughs> what did you do to that? <laughs> <laughs> this is the copy of Resident Evil Afterlife shot with a shotgun. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I guess we can talk about this afterlife instead. Afterlife, afterlife. I got Muncher here for this. Oh, uh, Muncher. He loves to eat metal, and his name is Muncher. Free floating metal Muncher. Definitely class five. She'd chew through metal if she could. Ooh, that DVD looks like some of them after she's through with them. <laughs> this is Muncher's dream here. So Phelan, this was a big deal for you, this Ghostbusters movie. This was uh, a, a true sequel. Answer the Call was kind of a soft reboot of it, but this was really like a continuation of the series. Yeah, that was in its own universe. Obviously, it's a divisive movie. <laughs> this one has the original characters, so it means a lot more to see them show up as those characters than random cameos like they didn't answer the call. Hey, Flat Top! Have you missed us? It certainly was a better tribute to Harold Ramis than the, like, the bust that was <laughs> in the other movie. <laughs> the Harold Ramis, like, <laughs> CG cameo in this movie. We'll just get into heavy spoilers immediately. Yeah, spoilers, if anyone cares, I guess. <laughs> I find that scene, I don't know, it gets to me a bit. I don't want to get into it too much, but it's like it kind of had death on my mind the first time I saw this and I found it affecting because of those reasons. In a, in a good way? In a bad way? Mixed? You know, it's bittersweet, I guess, seeing the Harold Ramis ghost show up in this movie. For me, it worked because this whole movie was leading up to it. It wasn't just like they had another thing and then they threw that in at the end, like, oh, but he, he's kind of here and so we can kind of do this. Like, this whole movie was really about his character and I think for the most part it worked as a send-off. There's some parts I would like if they were altered a little bit, but for the most part, I liked how they handled everything in regards to Egon. I think one of the really important thing is, I mean, we all miss Harold. Oh, Harold was yeah. such an important Jesus. part of this ensemble and our friendship. Jason found this wonderful way to sort of pay tribute to him. I feel, especially with uh, McKenna Grace's character as Egon's granddaughter, it would make a little bit more sense had he been in her life a little bit and she idolized him and then he you know, went to isolate himself on the farm and that's where she picked up some of these tendencies and stuff and that maybe he helped push her towards science and that's why she's so into that. Yeah, I do think that this movie uh, relied a little too much on callbacks sometimes. There were some times where it would go a little cringy where it's like, why did they do that? Because it happened in the first movie. There were some of them I think that really did work. They would do similar type things, but they were doing their own spin on it or it'd be like a gag, like a visual thing. You're like, okay, I kind of remember that. And if you know it, you know it. With Phoebe, I don't know why she would be exactly the same with with her smarts, but I do think that they varied it enough that she did feel like her own character. You could also read into it a bit that her character might be on the spectrum a little bit, like Egon seemed to be. This is a tectonic earthquake. Notice a little P wave followed by a large S wave. Yeah, I'm not an idiot. You could kind of read that into why they have similar personality types. You can see like uh, what McKenna Grace is doing with the character and that she's definitely invoking some of Harold Ramis's Egon in there, but yeah, not a complete impersonation or whatnot. You see she has some tendencies of him. I know how many sides there are in a triangle. I just thought you were being obtuse. Was that a geometry joke? Yes, that's why I winked. Ah, uh, that's terrible. No, I loved it. Yeah, I liked her for the most part. I thought she held the movie pretty well. I thought most of the kids did really well in this. It has a door and windows, like any ordinary house, but the distinct smell of evil. You think you'll ever leave? Even if I don't, what does that say about me? You don't have a car. <laughs> most of them I, I didn't recognize. I, we'd seen her in some stuff, like in Sabrina and Haunting of Hill House. Always in supernatural things. Yeah, lots of stuff like that. Um, Finn Balor, I think is the name of the, who played her brother. Uh, I think Allison is thinking of Finn Balor, the wrestler. The guy from Stranger Things is Finn Wolfhard. 
Hi, I'm Finn Wolfhard. Finn Baylor. Finn Wolfhard. He was in Stranger Things, so I thought they got a, a really good cast for this, and uh, the adults are really good too. So he left us nothing? I wouldn't say that. There is quite a bit of debt. Ray in the bookshop when they first introduce him. Uh, I'm with you in that I'm not really sure it, it rang true to me. Some of that felt like a little forced. I, I'm calling about Egon Spangler. Egon Spangler can rot in hell. It's a little overly bitter for Ray, especially. Like, you can tell he immediately kind of feels bad about it, but I just, I find it weird that that kind of viciousness comes out of Ray at all. Egon was like, these ghost problems don't aren't problems anymore. The apocalypse is really what the problem is, and then they get all bitter over that, and it's like they don't believe him. Then Egon started to tell people that their little ghost problems didn't matter because the world was coming to an end. I don't know if I believed that it got from point A to point B exactly like they were saying. He got spooky, freaked me out. But then again, I mean... There's been a long time that's passed, so maybe there's supposed to have been a little more to that story than that. I do think by the end it came together just fine. Just that initial scene, like, really, like, didn't feel true to the character to me. I wouldn't expect that kind of vitriol out of Ray. I would expect more kind of heartbroken if Egon did the things he did. So, like, stealing all their equipment, basically, in their eyes and stuff, and then disappearing. All gone! I think the Ghostbusters that, that came off the best in this movie were Egon and Winston. Egon was brains. Ray was the heart. Egon Spangler can rot in hell. Peter just kept it cool. Who were you? The sex appeal. Though I think, like, Ray uh, came, he came through in the end, and, like, Bankman was very funny. It's not really the focus on him, but he had his moments. Funny when you think about this movie, like, there are some funny moments. I like some times with the lame jokes that Egon's granddaughter tells and stuff. Yeah, when she's telling them to gozer to distract her, that was pretty funny. There's two whales in a bar, and one of them goes, oh. And then the other one goes, go home, you're drunk. And I kind of like that because Gozer does feel pretty dangerous in this because they have her immediately kill off J.K. Simmons and his cameo. We can rule the world. Yeah, oh, that was so funny. Not even facing the screen and gets torn in half. Yeah, Gozer, I think, felt like more of a, a physical threat than in the first movie because she got more to do. Um, it was mostly Stay Puft they were fighting in the first one. Yeah, I mean, Gozer always did come off super dangerous to me, but this time you got to see, I guess, a little bit more what Gozer would do if you cut that close to her. She had a creepy look. I think they did a good job updating it, but still feeling like the character or the design from the first one. They added, like, some CGI sparks going through her, and she had this like latex veiny suit. It's pretty cool. What surprised me actually is that most of this movie was really not about the Ghostbusters. I mean, it was about Egon's family and it was about legacy, um, the afterlife. But for the most part, it was about his granddaughter and his daughter. Um, and when it shifted in the end, when the, the first Ghostbusters showed up and they started teaming up, it was really good. Like, I really enjoyed that part, but it did feel like it was veering away from what the rest of the movie had done, which was really focusing on a, a, a much smaller story involving uh, Egon's family. When they show up, it kind of feels more like Ghostbusters. This movie isn't big on the comedy side of things for the most part. This is pretty straight. Well, he sounds like a royal dirtbag. I don't know, he was actually just a very ordinary dirtbag. At least uh, Phoebe turned out okay, right? I hope so. I don't know. And that feels true to Ghostbusters world because like Ghostbusters 1, it's basically a more serious story, but funny guys are handling it. I don't think it's too self-serious or anything. I'm just saying it's not nearly as comedic a movie as Ghostbusters 1 or 2. Yeah. Well, I guess also when you look at this compared to Answer the Call, which really focused on the comedy element and went a little too far in that direction. And I'm someone who I, I liked Answer the Call and I had a good time in the theater. I do think they did too much improv-y bits in it that really took away from the story and they were trying to tell. Ghostbusters! Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh did you want to? Sorry. sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next time. But it was a much different animal than this was, and I think this one was much more successful as part of the Ghostbusters franchise than the other one was. If you guys want to study ghosts, do it somewhere else, because I have two words for you. Let me guess. Get out? No. He's going to say suck it. He's not going to say suck it. Suck it. Answer the call is way too far in the other direction. 
from what this movie did, where they're like, let's take nothing serious, so you as an audience member kind of don't care as much. Like, there's some stuff I didn't think was terrible in that movie, but then there's stuff I really did not like or care for. How can you be eating right now? Once you pop. Just... They, the fact they don't care about the ghosts from the start of Answer the Call damaged it for me. This was the first Ghostbusters sequel that seemed like everyone didn't have collective amnesia about what happened in New York. <laughs> My dad says you guys are full of crap. Well, some Gosh. people have trouble believing in the paranormal. No, he just says you guys are full of crap and that's why you went out of business. Can you imagine though, like, Stay Puff happened and people never talked about that like years later. Like, I find that kind of hard to believe. <laughs> what happened in New York? The whole city was freaking out. And then these physicists showed up with these portable proton accelerators and blew the roof off of Manhattan high rise. None of this rings a bell? It happened 20 years before we were born. You experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? If the answer is yes, then don't wait another minute. Pick up your phone and call the professional. Ghost Blasters! Yeah. I also find it a little crazy that Stay Puff still exists as a brand in their universe. Like, if the whole giant Stay Puff Marshmallow Man thing in New York happened, you think at least they might have retired that mascot. They brought up Stay Puffed a lot. The slime stuff, they didn't seem as uh, remembering about that. Like, no one seemed to want to reference to that much, which seemed, which seemed equally big when um, the Ghostbusters, the original ones, first show up and they start doing the, like, are you a god thing? And then they're like, come on, Ray. Like, I mean, I think maybe it would have worked a little better if he just said yes, like, he's learned his lesson and, like, maybe they didn't so directly try to do what happened before or the like tiny little stay puffs going like Ooh. those are the gozarian are you a god ray oh come on ray yes i didn't mind the ray's hesitation but then he answers it differently this time because like i don't know i was happy I guess I was just happy once the original team showed up. Yeah, it was nice seeing them. I liked that part of the movie the best, and it wasn't just because they were there. I really think like all the elements were coming together, leading the story forward, fighting Gozer, the stuff with the kids, set the trap that had been set up by uh, Egon through the whole farm. I think it was a little short-sighted of Egon that he built this giant trap and I guess he never tested it, so the thing just kept blowing before it would actually catch the ghost. <laughs> Come on, Egon, you're supposed to be the super smart one. <laughs> he overlooked that. The, the reason it didn't work for him is because he was alone. And I think that they made a point of that because it wasn't working for them either until the team showed up and they started working together. He failed because he was alone and they came together as a team in the end, even when he had to do it in the afterlife. So it was kind of nice, you know, they wrapped it up together and kind of came full circle. And that's really the only way, well, one of the only nice ways that you can do a story like this because Harold Ramis isn't around anymore, so how do you tell that story? And I think this was a little bit nicer than like, yeah, it was a bummer that like, that Egon died, but anyway, let's do this. <laughs> Yeah, that would have sucked. I really like when the original team is busting Gozer and that like pans across and shows Egon's ghost and Winston's kind of like side eyeing. <laughs> I love that that him and uh, and Ray are like what, and then like Venkman's like. Hmm? Hmm. <laughs> I do like that Ray starts just like yeah, like smiling about it because <laughs> that felt more Ray than the angry lines when he's at the bookstore. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it really did come together better at the end, like he felt more in character there. And uh, I, I think that they made the smart decision to not have Egon talk, just kind of have the, the emotions of the scene speak for itself. Yeah, I do think it does kind of hit pretty well. It makes me sadder too, you know, with Ivan Reitman's passing as well. I needed an actor in there, and so we looked to Bob Gunton. Thank you. You're ready. He provided the performance Action, of Egon Spengler that was then taken and translated through a virtual character. The last thing either Jason or I wanted was to make this silly in any way. It had to be moving. Phoebe Spengler sharing the proton pack with her grandfather. For that moment, my father put on the Egon Spengler suit. And there's a couple shots in the movie that are of my father wearing 
Harold's old suit. And that was the most emotional moment for me. I do want to say the mini Stay Puffs. So this was a worry, right? That this was going to be like the focus of the advertising because merchandise and you can have mini Stay Puffs, which is what they were doing. In the movie itself, I think for the most part, they didn't come off too annoying. There was once or twice, like when they're like ooing over the Ghostbusters and stuff like that, where I'm like, you can rein it back a little bit. We don't need all this stuff. But it wasn't as prominent in the movie as I thought it would be. Same with like the, the muncher thing, which is really just kind of a Slimer callback. It was their beginner ghost for the kids. Kids. And a lot of this movie is just them kind of beginner Ghostbuster type stuff until the very last act. Junior Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, the Junior Ghostbusters with Zack or whatever. <laughs> well, that's the fifth turtle. What were the Junior Ghostbusters names? There were Junior Ghostbusters. <laughs> Little dipshit. We're the Junior Ghostbusters, and we're not afraid of no ghosts. No ghost. <laughs> Little dipshit one, two, and three. I don't think these kids came off like the junior Ghostbusters. I do think they built their characters very well. There is a reason why they were involved with this plot. And like the junior Ghostbusters when they got shoved into real Ghostbusters. Like they get involved with it because of Egon's family. I like the bits with Phoebe where she's like playing chess with Egon's ghost, I guess. Egon's ghost is like leading his family around through the movie, trying to get them to piece things together and figure this out. I do think it's kind of insane that the kid named Podcast, which is silly. It's like, I have a podcast, so my name's Podcast. Like, not very creative. And Podcast. Why do people call you Podcast? Oh, I call myself Podcast because of my podcast. At least he said it was that he nicknamed himself. <laughs> he's the only one who calls him that. Which was kind of funny that he's the only one who calls himself that, but like he has a supernatural podcast and he never heard of the giant marshmallow man that attacked New York in the 80s. Like you'd think that would be a big topic. <laughs> it's on YouTube and stuff. You think that Ray would have written in like, here's one story you haven't talked about. Mystical Tales of the Unknown Universe. MTW, that's you. You're my subscriber? Really found its voice in the 46th episode. But d does Ray like make a habit of listening to podcasts from some kid in the middle of nowhere? I mean, the kid does live in the Evo Shandor town, so maybe that's also why he wanted to listen to it. That's true. You know what? You made it make sense. That was pretty cool. I was glad that you reminded me of the, the Shandor stuff. That was the name of Dana's building, and that was the guy who built it to kind of be this ghost... Conduit. Conduit. That's the word. Your girlfriend lives in the corner penthouse of Spook Central. They did a good job expanding on this stuff. Even though they were fighting Gozer again, it didn't feel like uh, they were just doing the same story exactly. It is a little weird, though. It's like... Ghostbusters 2, I guess, is still canon with this movie, but like Ecto has been completely remodeled back to just normal Ecto-1 instead of all the bits that were added for Ecto-1A. And just like everyone talks about the one main thing that happened in New York with the Gozer fight and Stay Puft, no one remembers. I, Vigo, the scourge of Carpathia, the sorrow of Moldavia. Poor Vigo. <laughs> <laughs> 1984, ghosts attack New York City. Yeah, it kind of seemed like Egon took the Ecto-1 and then remodeled it back to what it used to look like and then added stuff, like there's a gunner seat. It has a gunner seat? But like, for who? <laughs> he was doing this alone. Who is this gunner seat for? <laughs> I guess they seem to imply there were still some hauntings that maybe happened after Ghostbusters 2, so maybe that was still during that point. You're right. I, yeah, I do like they added onto the gadgets in ways that seemed believable, and it didn't seem like they just updated it for the sake of this is 2021 and we need it to be cool and flashy. Like the fact that their goggles have like a little Polaroid camera in it to take pictures of the ghosts. and they felt very much like remnants of the 80s like they were things that they'd added to it but clearly they were kind of outdated I did find it funny how you were mentioning like every adult in this movie like really doesn't care they're all lackadaisical about what these kids are doing <laughs> they got two main adults in this movie they got paul rudd and their mom and both of them are just like ah. <laughs> 
kids be messing with ghosts or whatever. Going off to abandoned mines and stuff, and Paul Rudd's just like, let's show horror movies, that's my entire class. But they did show moments where they, like, they cared what was going to happen to them, which I think was different than, like, Answer the Call, where there was a lot of, like, eh, we don't really care, and there's no sense of, like, danger or any sort of stakes at points. Oh, you mean like Patrick Swayze? That's it. And then we were all dancing at a summer camp, and then we sat down, and he was behind me, and we made a vase. Oh, you're combining the two. I combined yeah. a couple of Swayze. Oh, movies. you know what was a good one? Roadhouse. I love Roadhouse. There's a major issue with that film. Everything, like, it hits in a way in this movie like everything hits kind of hard yeah this one had a little bit higher stakes and uh they made you care about the characters i wish there could have been like a little bit more with the original ghostbusters it is just the last act of the movie that they show up for and it's super great seeing them and then there's like bits in the credits which is really interesting i'm like ah oh, i wish i could have got more of this and like maybe they're hinting at that for the next movie but i wish they would stop doing this with movies where it's like all right we're gonna kind of tease for the next thing i can't believe you used to shock your students between us I only zap the guys. Ah! Just do the thing. Do the thing now. <laughs> you know? They didn't even feel like teasers. They're just, it felt like cutscenes. Like they were like, this interrupted the flow too much. So we're just going to put it at the end or something. The very last extra scene where they have Janine talking to uh, Winston, like they start that though with a cutscene from the original movie. Oh, right. That's right. Well, I guess, okay. I guess that's not fair. That did seem like it was leading up to something or at least saying like the Ghostbusters are going to continue what they were doing. And Winston was kind of leading the charge and using the money that he made with his success over the years to restart things and there was the lights flashing on the containment unit. I do like the, the reveal Winston's been successful since Ghostbusters 2 and stuff. You know what? It was about time he got his dues. Kept getting shafted off to all the covers and having his name not on the main credits. And you know what? Ernie Hudson looked great. He was the sex appeal like he said. Who are you? The sex appeal. He was the sex appeal. <laughs> He looked great. The scene with him and Janine, like, I don't think he got a whole lot of just banter between Janine and Winston says, cool to see just for that even. Yeah, interesting pair up there. He seemed to have the most balanced look at the whole thing. Like, cause he was just like, this was part of my life and now I have to do this and I'm taking care of my family, I'm taking care of my friends, but this is always part of my heart and like, I always kind of kept it open for that. And he seemed to have kind of like a good outlook about the whole thing. I may be a businessman, but I will always be a Ghostbuster. I did really like his line where he's like, sorry, my friend uh, Egon and <laughs> stuff. I'm sorry. I didn't believe you. I should have called. I miss you, my friend. They kind of felt, let him, I guess, fall out of touch with them. They didn't try much either, I guess. So a little regret on both sides. Yeah. It was nice they had that moment of closure there. And like the other cut scene, I really like that that shows Peter and Dana stayed together instead of having them break up again. And it was nice just, you know, having her kind of turn the tables on him and shock him with this stupid thing. <laughs> I wish she was in the movie a bit more. I would have liked to seen more Sigourney Weaver. I don't know, maybe they just didn't have a good story reason to like put her in there. It's not like she's gonna show up busting at the end. I mean, I guess she could have. I guess it'd be kind of cool. Maybe if they do another one and they include her at all, they'd show that. So that'd be neat. I don't know, that might be hoping for too much. <laughs> it'd be nice if they um, did a movie that was kind of more of a balance of what they did at the end of this movie. Because it wasn't just about the the main team of Ghostbusters and most of the movie really wasn't about them. It was um, about the the legacy left behind and the new generation, so to speak. So it'd be nice kind of if they, they had a melding of the two, kind of like extreme Ghostbusters was attempting, you know, where you have kind of the older mentors and then the new team coming in and, but it, you know, no one seems forgotten. When Harold Ramis is still alive, as always still hoping for like, you know, Maybe a movie where they start to set up another team, but the original ones have to come in and help. The original team, they're in a different point in their lives. They would have, I think, a different role in this kind of thing with Ghostbusters. It'd be nice to see what they were doing alongside with everyone and not just, well, they're done because they're too old to do it anymore. It'll always be sad that they didn't make a three while Harold Ramis was still alive, but the video game was still a cool, I guess, another branching continuity of two. You could always see extreme Ghostbusters as part of the continuity. Well, real Ghostbusters is 
is kind of its own continuity after the first movie. Well, the Ghostbusters movie is a movie within real Ghostbusters based on their lives. You know, he doesn't look a thing like me. That's their whole other a cartoon universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the supporting characters in this. I thought they had good moments. I thought Paul Rudd was pretty good. When I see a real proton pack or a ghost trap, I'm taken back to being a kid. From the trailers, I thought he was gonna be more of a, a main character, like uh, more of a like mentor to the kids or something, but he really isn't. He's kind of a supporting character. We should probably get out of here. You're an adult. Yeah. And liable. I liked Lucky, who was the girl that works at the restaurant that, uh, was it Trevor, the brother's name? I feel like it was Trevor, though. Yeah. Her and Podcast both became part of this kid team. It was nice that their mom, she had her own arc to, to go through where she thought her dad had abandoned her and she didn't really know him very well. And she saw that uh, he'd been following her life, even though he had to be apart from her the whole time. Egon could have called them. That's true. We don't really know what all Egon was doing. It's nice to see a Ghostbusters story that's not set in New York. So that's another thing that's nice about this movie. Give it a different setting. It felt different than all the other movies. There was a lot of callbacks, obviously, but because they'd set it in this small town and it wasn't in the city and they weren't trying to repeat the first movie as exactly. And in a way, the second and Answer the Call were both kind of doing that, repeating some similar beats to what the first movie had done. Yeah, even though this was about Gozer, it was kind of a bit more different in like the, the formula, I guess. And I think that's the direction that the series should be going in because Ghostbusters is a world that really can be expanded on really easily. Like you have the ghosts, you have Ghostbusters. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the original team because ghosts can be anywhere. You could have anyone using this technology. So it'd be nice to see different kinds of Ghostbusters, different kinds of places, different kinds of ghosts. And it'd be nice to see more with the original team too, but it doesn't have to be New York gets taken over by something. I guess other branches of Ghostbusters could exist and no one remembers because everyone seems to forget a lot of things in this. Maybe there were smaller victories no one knew about. And like, I do kind of wonder what they were hinting at, like how long they stayed together as a team after two. Things got slow, hauntings got thin. Thinkman thought we did our job too well. Which I guess you just have to kind of do the math from the daughter's age. I think it was funny, you know, you know, they did the gatekeeper and the key master again with like Egon's daughter and Paul Rudd. I did like how they catch the terror dog out of Cali and that kind of like rips Gozer out of this world like partially. She's only still sort of there, barely holding her form. The fact that you can do that and it just makes her normal again. And then the terror dog ends up possessing Lucky <laughs> and it's like, well, that's a good thing. You know, the the bonding between Paul Rudd didn't happen with Lucky, because that would have been a lot more awkward. I guess that was Lucky for Lucky. <laughs> Before we became dogs and opened the gates of hell, I think that um, maybe we... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I think so too. It was a bit reference-y too, that the fact that Callie's clothes just turn into the same dress Sigourney Weaver had. Was it the same? I thought Sigourney Weaver's was red. Yeah, well, a very similar one. Ghost-like repetition and patterns. They kind of do the same things over and over again. Not really clear if Gozer even recognizes the Ghostbusters, because they're asking if they're gods, so maybe this is supposed to, it's repeating because ghosts just kind of do the same thing over and over again. I think she remembers us. They thought she recognized them. I did like Peter saying like, oh, it'll never work between us anymore. It's we could have been the most spectacular power couple. My sense of fun and your personality. But no, you always had to vanquish. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That felt like a very in character and it didn't feel too forced. I just wish we could have got to that point a little quicker and then had a little bit more with them. But otherwise, yeah, I really enjoyed this movie for the most part. A couple things I would tweak, I guess, if I was making it. But other than that. Yeah, I agree. I think like it would have flowed a little bit nicer if the older Ghostbusters had been introduced earlier in the movie because it did feel uneven. Number one reason why 
Oh, good try, anyway. I really enjoyed that part of the movie, though, and I enjoyed the part that was before it. I just don't know if those transitioned uh, as smoothly into each other as they could have. But otherwise, like, I thought it was a pretty solid movie. I liked this one. I liked Answer the Call, but I think this was more successful, and I think this, like, resonated a lot more with people. Do you think, like, this is, like, a good way to, to kickstart things into a new part of the franchise? Yeah, and I think it is the best way to do it at this point. Again, like it's, oh, I really wish we could have gotten a more proper Ghostbusters 3 at one point. A lot of heart and a lot of genuine intelligent writing by Harold Ramis. Harold did the good writing and Dan wrote the rest. And, uh... But, you know, I think they handled Egon in a way that worked. When he shows up as a ghost, it always kind of makes me feel something, so they did something right there. I would like to see more in this vein with Ghostbusters. I'd like to see more Winston in whatever they do next. feel like since they had Ernie Hudson have that setup bit that he's on board to do something more. That'd be so cool if like Winston was like the new kind of leader mentor type. That's what it kind of seems like to me that they set up so I think that would be neat. That's so cool. Yeah and hopefully you can have Ray and Peter show up for a bit. Who was it who said the firehouse was like a Starbucks now? Was that Ray? Yeah but it was at the end. It was there. We lost the firehouse. It's a Starbucks now. Yeah, it was all abandoned and stuff. Apparently he he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's blowing stuff out his ass there. He's just making stuff up. Lying to this little girl on the phone. Who are you gonna call? Someone else. My final thoughts on this. I had a good time watching it. I enjoyed watching it with you. I think this was like a better note and better direction to go in with Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters Afterlife isn't exactly what I imagined a sequel to Ghostbusters 2 being, but it's one that's pretty happy be with. It feels like a nice tribute to Harold Ramis and the Egon character, and you can tell it was done with love. While it's not devoid of comedy or anything, it does feel like a much more serious movie, which is partly due to the sad story of Egon's death, and that the original team only really starts being a part of events and wisecracking on them in the last act. McKenna Grace really nailed the role of Phoebe Spangler, which was super important for getting you invested in Afterlife's story, and hopefully this will be the starting point for some new stories in the original Ghostbusters universe. We're ready, ready for, for the, the end credits! credits. I don't like this movie, doesn't do friendly, this food like is so fake, that toy is gonna break, famous don't let me down, you need to be around, grab that chocolate piece. I even like it cause I want Failers so failers Bring on more to comedy Failers so failers And animation movies Failers so failers What we really is so fun Failers so failers What's your opinion about? I think this was like a better note and better direction to go in with Ghostbusters. Yeah. The end, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>